All right, welcome back. My guest is joining me right now from Lagos. She is Aima Lohi Higo, the transformation lead at uh, Alliance Nigeria. Hello, Aima, and thanks for Hi. joining me on the show today. Hi, Nancy. Thank you so much for having me. You look gorgeous today. Thank you. You too. Tell me how Lagos is. Where is your office? Are you still working from home? Or has the Todd Mainland Bridge... I really don't know where your office is in Lagos, but has the Todd Mainland Bridge skewed the movement? It, it definitely so our office is on Adeola Odeco in BI, okay. so, and we're, we're still working quite flexibly because of the traffic and, of course, trying to comply with, you know, trying to be COVID compliant mm. as well. We, we, we'll be looking at the rising um, or rising cases of cyber attacks. Uh, Alliance uh, Global, because you are in the Alliance Nigeria office, came up with uh, the report managing increased cyber risk. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but let me take it from this angle that cyber risk have now become a major threat to businesses. Mm -hmm. And some people don't still understand that. How do you think that globalization, commercialization, as well as that interconnectivity has, uh, has you know, worsened the severity and the frequency of uh, increased cyber incidences as well as data breaches? Yes. Um, so firstly, because of globalization, there's a much heavier reliance on IT infrastructure. You know, we always say if you use the internet, then you know, don't expect privacy. So as long as companies are still you know, trying to um, be more digital, going online, you know, there, would always be, um, there would always be opportunity for people to, you know, to enter that gap and try to, to take advantage of, 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 of your systems. So you know, we're seeing that even it's moving from large corporates to even SME people who are now being who are now being vulnerable to these attacks. So we're definitely seeing that um, you know increased global. I mean, the cyber insurance market is even growing. As at Q3 2020, it was about seven billion dollars, you know, in, in premiums. So we, we will continue to see an increase in you know IT reliance and increase in um, investing in IT infrastructure as long as we're continuing to go digital. Okay, I imagine, can you just explain primarily to my views, perhaps why, what cyber risks are? Uh, because mm. you, you mentioned it, at least in passing, if you're using emails, you're, you're online and all of that, you're open to cyber attacks and cyber risk. But what primarily is a cyber risk? What is an attack, cyber attack? What is a data breach? So, I mean, they, they can come in different forms. So there's a cyber liability aspect. So for instance, where um, you have privacy breaches, where as a result of maybe a ransomware attack, for example, you are unable to access your data or, or has asked you for money in exchange for data. So that's, that's a data breach that's resulting in you paying, you know, in you paying money out of, of the company. And there's also the aspect of cyber crime, which is third party theft, obviously the popular Yahoo, Yahoo you know, activities. So it, it's, it's really just those two elements of you know, cyber liability that deals with privacy liability, data breaches, and of course the cyber crime that deals with um, third party theft. So those are the two sort of areas that, that we involve. Okay, Aima, which one of those perhaps are we susceptible here in Africa more? Is um, it the ones dealing with the Yahoo Yahoo or the ones, you know, that people will be able to resonate with that. Yeah. Um, you know, if, even though cyber events do still remain quite um, underreported and um, or not reported at all, we, we do see that every hour um, there are thousands of cyber events occurring. In so I think people are more familiar with cyber crime because of how, um, how, um, how it is, how popular it is. You know, but we, we are seeing that a lot of um, data breaches are happening and more so because, um, and, and they're becoming more expensive, more so because of the um, legislation. So I don't know if you're aware, but Nigeria has its own privacy, data privacy laws that came into effect 2019. So once those, and, and those, those, um, those laws really stringent penalties for data breaches, you know, so it, it might be that cybercrime is more fancy, so to speak, but there are, you know, enormous data breaches happening, and we do expect that we would see a lot of costs arising from, from those incidents. Mm. Can, can, okay, okay, let me ask this question before I go into the cost, counting the cost of some of this increased cyber risk. Uh, why mm -hmm. do you think that cyber risk is 
you know, one of the most, if not the most underestimated kind of mm. risk that businesses, uh, uh, you know, have right now, even in the evolving mm. risk landscape. Because mm. if we're talking about risk, we're not just talking about even cyber risk, we're talking about fire incidences, we're talking mm. about some other kind of risk too that businesses can face. But why is it mm. that cyber risk is one of the underestimated or you don't even look at it at all as mm. a risk? Some people don't even think of it. Mm -hmm. So again, I think it's, it's, the, it's the knowledge. So like earlier, if you are on the internet, then you can't expect privacy. So I think people, people don't really think that um, they are at risk until maybe they're, they're some big organization or they have a lot to lose. But even as small as you being hacked, your, your, your credit card, your, date, your debit card being hacked, you know, pe pe people think it's still small, it's still small um, scale. And I think also for the larger corporates, it's more of a reputational thing. Obviously, if you have to report that you have been hacked, and then you do have to report because of the regulations acts that, that you report. It's a reputational risk thing for, I think, for most companies to come outside and then say, you know, we have been susceptible, we have been breached. So I, I think it's, it's a lot of, you know, misinformation, a lot of um, a lack of knowledge of how exposed people are. And then more so the effect of having to report these incidents or having to, you know, own up to being um, being in a cyber, you know, situation. I, I think that's really what it is. Mm. You talked about the data privacy uh, law in Nigeria in 2019. Mm. I know that some people may not even be aware of this. Can you break mm. it down before I come over? Because I'm just taking our views on a gradual mm. ride so that we can you know, open up like when a flower is opening in the morning. Blossoming. Yes. <laughs> so it's not as if we just hit them. So we need to take them. Yeah. I'm taking you all on a journey. So talk mm -hmm. to us about the data privacy law 2019 and perhaps what it entails for Nigerians mm -hmm. that are watching. Uh, how can that law be of advantage to them? So the, the privacy laws were enacted in 2019 and they pretty much modeled the European similar privacy laws. And what they do is to um, is to sort of give you guidelines as to how to obtain data, for instance, personal data from people, from data subjects, how to store the data, how to process the data, how to encrypt, how to pass on the data. So the, the regulations really are, you know, focused on data privacy and data breaches. Of course, it was enacted, you know, based on the, the global landscape and how much more expensive these things are. And, you know, it's just to have people be more aware of and to be more responsible about the data that they are holding, you know, on, the, on behalf of people. And it also does give, like I mentioned earlier, it does give high penalties for, you know, for, for breaching. So, for instance, you can pay up to 2% of your revenue, you know, if you are found to have breached a certain, you know, aspect of, of, the, of the law. And then, and one thing that's also very important country specific. So it's person or data subject specific. So if you have um, a member or an employee of or a data subject that is living in Nigeria, for instance, or, and it's also like an American citizen or, or an EU citizen. So the EU law will apply to the person irrespective of where the person is working, you know, detail for if I was a Nigerian in the UK, the Nigerian law will apply. So it, it's, um, it's not it's people specific is not some jurisdiction specific um, as it were. Mm. So w w w w what's the role of businesses that handle data, especially for Nigerians within that law? You know, because a lot of businesses are in charge of our data, be it personal. Mm -hmm. We're talking of banks, for example. Mm -hmm. Banks have your data. They ha also have your money. A lot of people mm -hmm. will say, okay, fine, they do this. They don't get their monies and they've been debited or someone mm -hmm. has hacked into the account using their ATM cards and all of that. So what's the mm -hmm. role of businesses, data mm -hmm. handling businesses, in Nigeria within the space of this law? Yeah, so I mean, luckily, um, legislation has helped us. So for the financial institution space, there was a recent regulation by CBN on, you know, having to, on how to really just protect your systems and protect your clients, and also even encouraging, you know, institutions to get cyber insurance because of the sort of increase of cyber crime events mm -hmm. that we've been seeing. So luckily, the laws have helped us in that regard, in addition to this um, private, privacy legislation. So each, each company, and I think without having to, you know, worry about being compliant about the law, it's, it's, where, it's where the market is going, it's where the future is. If people can't trust you with their data, if they can't trust that, they, you know, you will be safe, then they, are, they will be unwilling to do business with you. So whether you're an SME or whether you're a large corporate or even an, an individual, you know, you, you know it's, it's so important for you to understand your obligations, you know, 
whilst keeping um, third party data, for example. Mm. Now let's come down to the COCO, which is the AGCS, the Alliance Global Corporate and Specialty uh, Report. I have a summary with me here. I tried okay. to look at the report. I think it's 40 something pages, if I'm not mistaken. Or so I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm if I, when, yeah. it, when it was sent to me, I had to tell Lesiba in South Africa. I, 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 I suspended it for a while because I was like, <laughs> Can I get a summary? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was like reminding me, email Nancy, I've sent the report, I've sent the report. I was like, Okay, fine, let me go through it. <laughs> then we'll talk about okay. it. Then, so, so break down the report for, for our views because. Um, what I'm seeing here, I saw quite a few numbers. That's a 2% rise in average cost of cybercrime to an organization yeah. in five years. It's about $13 million. So just give us a summary of what the report, okay. say, what the report is. Okay, so as you mentioned, AGCS is one of the entities within the Alliance Group. So they are the center of competence for cyber insurance and have been writing cyber since 2013. The point was to analyze um, cyber-related claims within a five-year period. And um, as at Q3, we saw that the estimated cost of claims was about $700 million. And so these claims are not just those reported to Allianz, but also other insurers within, within the market. So it really was to give the landscape of, the, of how much this, um, this peril is progressing in over the years. So maybe one of the key things that, uh, like, for instance, 54% of um, cyber incidents are caused by internal events. And when I mean when I say that I mean um, employees error, human error, IT IT outage, or any 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 of that stuff. Whereas the, the rest goes to external events like phishing, like ransomware. So even even though the internal events are more frequent, we see that the external events cost much more to you know to to handle. So things like that we have, you know the, the report highlights. You know it also um, highlights that ransomware attacks are becoming more prevalent. And ransomware attacks are really, you know, if somebody gets into your systems and says, oh, I'm not going to give you back your data unless you give me $100 million, or now people are, are paying Bitcoin for ransomware attacks. It also highlights that that's also an increasing risk that we, an increasing risk that we are seeing. Also because it's, you know, it's ransomware attacks, has, cyber hacks has become commercialized. People can buy malware on the dark net, they can mm. sell for cheap, and they can distribute, you know, accordingly. So the report does highlight a rise in, in, in that. And also, you know, like you mentioned, the, the increase in the, last couple, in the last year, really due to the pandemic, we're seeing an increase in remote working, of course. So people are using their personal, um, personal appliances as opposed to, you know, if you were in an office setting, you would have more robust IT security in your system. So there's a lot of opportunity now for hackers to plug in those gaps, and they are, they are getting more crafty, you know, by, by the day. Hmm. Uh, you, you know, so it means that as the world was on a lockdown and a lot more people working from home, we saw yeah. increasing risks of cyber mm -hmm. attacks because perhaps we're using more of our personal equipment. Is exactly. That it? So that, yeah, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that is, that, that's very important. So because we expect that, you know, in the offices, obviously a much higher IT sort of cyber resilience, you know, framework, whereas you are um, you're using all sorts of applications, you're using your personal um, systems. You know, so there's a tendency that the, the, the resilience factor is much less whilst working at home. So yes, that's, that's something that really has um, happened over the last few months. Mm. Why are we beginning to see that commercialization of cyber hacks, like you said earlier, because people are now buying malwares mm -hmm. and coal. Why are we seeing that increased commercialization? And did the report also highlight perhaps areas where we're seeing that increased commercialization of cyber um, hacks? I would, yeah, I would say mainly in the most advanced countries. You know, recently there's been a few um, events that have happened, I believe um, in South Africa, they had to shut down their, their, global, their systems for because of the hack. I know in Germany as well. So it's mainly in the advanced um, areas that we see this commercialization of, of, of cyber hacks. But I guess you know people people wanna people wanna go to where they can make money. So I would you know they would they would focus on companies maybe like FIs because they know how much what what the what the potential income to them will be, and then focus on people who also have personal data. So for like um, healthcare, for hoteliers, for airlines, you know that those, that kind of data is so expensive because it's so sensitive. 
So, you know, they want to focus on those areas of the market and, you know, maximize the, the, the income potential for them. It's, it's, it's what it is, really. Mm. If we take a look at some of the trends that you mentioned, that Alliance talked mm -hmm. about in that report, and you mentioned earlier that we have both external and uh, internal uh, attacks, which ones occur more frequently and which type of attacks are more expensive? Mm -hmm. So the internal, at the internal events occur much frequently. So we see um, human error, employee maybe clicking on that phishing mail that you told not to be clicked on. You know, so we, we see a lot of that happens frequently. But as, as far as um, severity, it's the external events. So the ones from the outside cyber hackers, the you know, denial of service attacks, the ransomware, the phishing, you know, those ones cost more in the long run. Mm. So at the end of the day, for people watching right now, how do, how do we protect ourselves? Or how do we protect mm. our digital assets? And how do companies protect our mm. di di digital assets so that we don't have a rise in cyber insurance claims? Yeah, so, we, you know, we always say, and this is for any sort of, you know, business, that the best way is to be preventative. What are the steps that you can take prior to, you know, to an event like this occurring? So in this instance, if it's for cyber, it's to, you know, ensure that you have updated, you know, IT infrastructure, IT systems. Your, um, your data is encrypted. Make sure that your employees are constantly being made aware of the implications of you know, clicking on that false information. Ensure that you have a crisis management plan, such that even when that event occurs, then you are able to bounce back into business. So really, it's, it's, a, it's a value chain of you know, preventative things that you can do to, you know, to ensure that your cyber resilience is at its peak. And um, of course, the cyber insurance, of course, I'm going to mention that. Um, which really should be the last point in your in your goal to cyber resilience because we tend to come after the fact. But you know, prevent prevent prevention is better than cure. I think that's what they say. And you know, of course, cyber insurance is enough to you know to lessen your financial burden. Even with all those things that we're saying, why do you think that businesses or companies are still trying to play catch up? You mm. know, because um, even in Nigeria or even across the world, I think even some countries you know some businesses yeah. we've heard at least in the last few months even covid 19 mm -hmm. pandemic that oh they they were open to cyber attacks and all of that why mm -hmm. with this trend why is it that companies are still trying to play catch up um you know i i think i want to be positive and say that i think this year has really been a one you know one that nobody expected I think maybe we need to give ourselves a bit more time post this year to see how people really react. Because I have seen a lot of change from, you know, from large corporates or from SMEs as a result of the pandemic and as a result of having to work from home and, and all that. So yes, we're, we're, maybe we're still playing catch up, but I'm quite positive that we'll see a lot of improvements in, in that area. Okay, the, the graph that my team put on the screen, can they put it back there again so that we can look at it in terms of uh, the, your risk by revenue and which causes of business interruptions are feared most by companies. And it's quite in interesting that cyber mm -hmm. attacks come out first, I think with 55%, then we have fire mm -hmm. and natural causes. So businesses are not so inundated with the idea that perhaps an earthquake will happen mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. a flood disaster than mm -hmm. cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, you know, that the, the cyber attacks and the, the interruption is also kind of linked because if you have an attack that prevents you from accessing your systems, for example, or if you're like an online, an online sales platform and you can't, you know, you can't make money, there's a, like either a dip in revenue or there's an, you know, an abrupt stop in, in revenue. So, yes, um, people do, you know, there is a um, and cyber like resultant impact of those events is the interruption I know that, that, that we are seeing. Of this um, report is 2020, so there's a new one that's going to come out 2021. I would be, you know, I would have to the guess that cyber will still remain number one, especially now, you know, since the pandemic and since all that's happening. I have to the guess that we will still see cyber being very top, you know, in, in those charts. Mm. Let's talk about the very interesting parts, which is business email compro compromise in your report, mm. which you said have grown. And I mm. saw also in the report that FBI said, I think from 2016 or so, that the amount has grown in terms of business email compromise spoofing. 
uh, to, mm -hmm. from 2016 till now, I think $26 billion. We know uh, the news we got around some Nigerians involved in scamming, you know, mm -hmm. some American firms and all of mm -hmm. that. Why are we seeing that sophistication in business email compromise? Because for some people, they may be used to the traditional means in terms of when you get to your email or you see someone send you an email that come and take the money you didn't keep or come and take the money your grandmother you never had has kept in a certain will. Some mm. don't will say, okay, these are fraudulent people, but it mm. has grown and it is now more sophisticated with the report has mentioned. So can you just expand on that? Absolutely. Um, and again, because there's still much, there's more reliance on, you know, emails on IT, we, we will let to see I think you know this, these hackers also expect people to not be as observant or be as proactive and again goes back to the awareness you know if, if you don't continue to you know, to let your, your employees know or let your people know that this, this is a really huge risk for your organization then we will continue to see these things these things happening. Um, again, working from home, it means that there's more, you know, frequent emails than as opposed to face-to-face -face meetings. The opportunity is there for people to, you know, to take advantage of. You know, so I would just say again, always, you know, employee awareness is, is so important to, you know, to, to battling this. Mm. Okay, since we've seen a lot of remote working, are there mm -hmm. things that we can do to protect ourselves? Are there things that we can consider to protect ourselves from, you know, um, being victims of yeah. all of those things that we're talking about. Okay. So, you know, on your personal computer, for example, it, it's as easy as making sure that your viruses are up to date, that your firewalls are up to date, that you have sufficient backup, you know, backup on your systems. And that means that if you do have, you know, a, a breach of some sort, you are able to retrieve the data and then carry on, you know, as normal. So things like that, you know, updating your software, you know, these are the small things that you can sort of do at home to, you know, to, to prevent um, these things from happening, you know, prior to when you to them work, you know, in that sort of organized environment, you know, in, in the office. Yeah. Aima, can you actually give me like a cost we're looking at in terms of even the cyber insurance claims, in terms of what this is costing us, in um, the rise in cyber attacks, cyber mm -hmm. risk. Is there really a cost to, to all of this? What's the cost like? Globally, do, we, do you have it segmentized? Uh, so uh, according to the report, as of Q320, we the, the cost of claims was over $700 million. And as you recall, in, you know, in underdeveloped countries, well, developing countries like us and other, you know, and, and other areas, we see that these events are still being underreported or not reported. So we may not have the exact figure as far as the cost, but I hazard a guess that it's, you know, multiple more times, you know, what, what has been, you know, recorded in this report. What is the role of regulation in, in all of this that we've been talking about? Mm, so um, regulation, regulations help to, to enforce. And, you know, it, it's okay to have, you know, a nice sort of um, law that says this is what we do, this is what we do. But it's more important to ensure that there is compliance. And like I mentioned, you know, we're very happy that, um, for, for instance, for insurance, um, sorry, for the banks, CBN is doing their part. For data, they're also doing their part. So we are very happy to see that regulators are seeing, you know, how important it, it is for people to be protected from, you know, from cyber hacks. So as long as they're able to comply, as long as people are able to, you know, report incidents timely, then we, we will we'll be moving in the right direction. And you know what regulation also does, especially in advanced countries, it also brings in some kind of litigation because some mm -hmm. people may not be happy and they, you know, they go to the courts and, and all of that. Did we see an increased case even when the world yeah. was, was on a slow down? Um, yes, yeah, so one of the, the, the trends that we, we did see was an increase in litigation and um, class action suits. So maybe not so much in areas like Nigeria, but, you know, where they have stiffer regulations, you know, like the EU, in the UK, in America, we, we have seen a trend of an increased, um, you know, increased class action suits. So people are coming together and going to court and saying that, no, you guys did not protect my data. You guys didn't do all that you had to do to ensure that I was safe. 
So that, that's definitely a concern and it's a trend that we, we have seen and will continue to see. One interesting thing I saw in your report is that buying a company can also come with cyber risk. Explain mm -hmm. that. <laughs> so if I want to buy a company, I should be able to say, okay, what cyber risk am I also buying? And people yeah. may not think of that, isn't it? That's an interesting exactly. part. But when I saw it, I was like, oh, really? Acquiring a company mm -hmm. or perhaps the M&As, they should also look mm -hmm. at what are the data, data bridges. And what came to my mind, I'm not saying the access diamond thing. So it's not, it could yeah. be any... It could be any company, but when you want mm -hmm. to acquire, when you want to buy a company, you should also put that into consideration. Exactly. So in that, in, in addition to, you know, when, when, you're in, when you're joining companies or when you're acquiring or you're merging, there's an integration of, you know, of systems. And so when that happens, there's, there's opportunity for that to be, you know, there's, an, there's a gap for people, to, for people to take advantage of. So we've seen, and, and a client, if we see that maybe you've done, mergers or in the last three years or several mergers were kind of like okay we need to be now we need to be more careful because it's a lot of exchange of you know by t of infrastructure so yes you know um, m and do also pose a, a threat to you know to cyber security i'm a, are, are countries also at risk of the cyber attacks uh, because we've uh, seen that some people are saying that it's not about fiscal warfare anymore is about cyber warfare and the war is online. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we know even the, 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 the perception that China has, for example, or the Russians, you know, and all of that. So are there increased risk of nations uh, facing or being attacked, uh, mm -hmm. you know, cyber risk? Absolutely, absolutely. And because, you know, everybody, you know, cyber, um, the cyber security space is anonymous. So whatever they like and like you mentioned you know with the whole drama with the u.s and you know with uh, with russia during the elections it, it's really a weapon to you know to create to create um havoc in, in in countries there's so much that can be done politically with you know with cyber um attacks as we have seen um maybe luckily or it might be that it's also underreported we may not have that experience so much in this part of the world but you know in China, Russia is a significant risk, uh, you know, for, for them. Mm. For a country like Nigeria, is there, is there any way we can protect ourselves uh, in the cyberspace? Or we haven't gotten to that level yet? Oh, that's not I, what we are talking about now. We're still talking about food inflation and price of onions, onions has gone up. So, um, I, but is I, this I, something I, our government can look at in terms of even protecting its own digital assets? Definitely. And, and I think the government is looking at it. So there, there may be need a lot of work done and a bit more, you know, having to organize priorities. But there's a lot of things that the government can do to, you know, to ensure that we're more cyber resilient. There's so many, um, so many organizations that offer this service, so many IT experts, so many infrastructure experts. So it's, um, I think the government is already doing, you know, what it can, but we would like to see you know, a, a lot more from them. Mm. So as we end the conversation, what would you like to end with, with uh, around the 14-page report that was released by your company? Uh, what mm -hmm. should we take home? Uh, viewers watching right now, what should they take away? So um, the th um, three things, prepare, practice, prevent. Mm. I saw the that at the end of the report. Saw that. You know, there, there, there you are. So those are the three things that we, we want to have people you know, keep in the back of their minds ensure that you are you know always thinking risk prevention rather than ensure that you have you know all the right things in place cyber resilience wise that you have a crisis management plan you know when these events do occur and most importantly that you have a backup plan because the, the longer that it takes you to come back to business once these things have happened and the worse off you are so you know i mentioned you know prepare prevent practice, those are the three things that we, we, you know, we really want to have people you know, have in their minds. Mm. I wanted you to end on that note, and you really got me the ending on that note. That was why I asked that question. So you were smart yeah. enough. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> you were smart enough to say it. And for everyone to really be security conscious, mm -hmm. online security is quite key. Cyber security is quite key. And not when you open your phone or when you open your email. 
as well as for the BEC, the business email compromise. You see, mm -hmm. oh, I'm a social attorney. I have two million dollars from your grandmother that never existed like, somewhere. Yeah, from your brother in yeah. principle. Yes, <laughs> and you just open and you start conversing with the person. At the end of the day, you get hacked or something. So, but they mm -hmm. come in different dimensions. Thank you very much, Aima, for putting perspective into all of Thank what you. we've discussed. Thank you so much, Nancy. I had a great time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I've been speaking with Aima Lohi uh, Higo. Uh, the transformation lead at Alliance Nigeria. We've been looking at in, in managing increased um, cyber risk. I hope you all learned one or two things from the interview. If you haven't, please give us a chance tomorrow in case you've, you will learn something. But I know you've learned something today. So join us again tomorrow, same time on the station. I am Nancy Naji. Be the best you can be, but the change you want to see by now. <laughs>